Hello, and welcome to ventricular filling, the clinical perspective of preload, the way we load volume into our ventricles. I'm Barbara McLean, and I'm a critical care clinical specialist and a hemodynamics expert. So join me as we discuss ventricular filling conceptual and applicable at our bedsides in the critical care unit. So always, again, very important to remember that the right and the left heart are unique separate systems that are conjoined through a wall, through a sac, and through shared circulations. And the measures that we make that help us to understand right and left heart function are incredibly important in underlying our methods of intervention to improve blood flow dynamics. So we think about a number of events, and just as an explanation before we go forward, if you see red, that means oxygenated blood flow, and if you see blue, that means deoxygenated blood flow. And when we are applying concepts such as pressure to both oxygenated and deoxygenated side, those will have neutral colors, like black for the arterial pressure and gray for the venous pressure. So first we start with pressure. We have a love affair with pressure at the bedside. We're always driving to improve pressures and to make them correct for what we believe is right for our patient. But it is important to remember that pressure is not volume. Pressure is a reflection of compliance when the chamber is filled with volume. So when I load the ventricle, if the ventricle is compliant, the corresponding pressure will not be high. If the ventricle is non-compliant, the corresponding pressure will be high. Now that takes a perfect explanation when we talk about arterial pressure. Arterial pressure is about the resistance of the arteries to the bolus of blood from the ventricles. And arterial pressure is something we chase aggressively at the bedside. Oftentimes, first giving volume to the ventricle in hopes that that volume will move into the artery. And secondly, by increasing the resistance of the arteries with our vasopressor administration. But it is again important to remind oneself that pressure is always about volume and the resistance of a chamber being filled. So systemic arterial pressure and pulmonary arterial pressure are reflections of ventricular bolus of blood into the artery, PA systole or systemic systole, and the vascular tone of that artery, PA diastole and systemic diastole. And then we move to the venous pressure. The venous pressure is about the filling of the ventricle, not the ejection, the filling of the ventricle and how that volume moves into the ventricular chamber related to ventricular compliance and valvular integrity. Our pulmonary venous pressures are reflective of the filling of the left ventricle and our systemic venous pressures are reflective of the column of blood as it moves into the right ventricle. Increased volume typically does not increase pressure unless you have a loss of compliance. Now that's all about the blood flow. That blood flow is the power of the cardiac ejection. And that power of the cardiac ejection is measured in the systemic arterial bed as stroke volume and calculated as cardiac output or measured in the pulmonary arterial bed as cardiac output and we calculate the stroke volume. Now, that ultimate purpose of blood flow is to deliver gas. Left heart delivering oxygen to the cells, and we look at SAO2 and SpO2 and PaO2 to reflect that arterial oxygen, and the right heart to deliver deoxygenated blood to the alveolus in order to promote gas exchange and uptake of oxygen. And when we evaluate that function, we remind ourselves that we look at SVO2 and SCVO2 as an expression of what is left after the cells have used oxygen. It's always a reserve and cells will dip into that reserve when they need oxygen and there isn't an adequate delivery. So that brings us to our basic concepts. We look at the filling of the ventricle, the column of volume into the chamber, compliant or non, we use central venous pressure to reflect the column of volume as it fills the right ventricle. 
But again, I want to remind you that central Venus pressure, despite losing some of its allure in the recent years, central Venus pressure is incredibly valuable. Not so much about volume, but so significantly affected by changes in right ventricular compliance. Central venous pressure is a measure of the column of the deoxygenated blood volume returning to the right ventricle. And we look at the left ventricle, and we would love to be able to do pulmonary venous pressure monitoring, but we cannot really do that because we can't put a catheter in the pulmonary vein. But the left ventricle is filling with volume from the pulmonary veins, from the pulmonary capillaries, and from the pulmonary artery. So we look at distant measurements of that pressure column reflected as wedge pressure or PA diastole, telling us about the compliance of the left ventricle and the amount of volume that is filling it. In days of old, we also occasionally would have a catheter in the left atria when a patient returned from cardiovascular surgery. That practice now is very minimized, but left atrial pressure, of course, also reflects left ventricular filling pressure. Now the ventricles eject, and the ventricles eject in order to move blood to the place where gas exchange occurs. Right ventricle moves its blood up into the pulmonary vault in order to promote the removal of carbon waste, CO2, and the uptake of oxygen. We look at ventricular ejection, right ventricular ejection, as reflected in the pulmonary bed as the systolic pulmonary pressure. That systolic pulmonary arterial pressure reflects right ventricular ejection. And we measure the cardiac output in the pulmonary artery, which is also a reflection of the right ventricle. The left ventricle mobilizes oxygenated blood out into the order, aorta and into the system and then perfusing the capillaries for gas uptake at the cell and for CO2 removal. We measure systolic arterial pressure as a reflection of left ventricular ejection. The left ventricle ejection into the arteries can be measured as stroke volume, looking at the area under the curve of the pulsatile beat. And stroke volume significantly reflects ejection fraction, which is the fraction of blood delivered, stroke volume, divided by the total blood that has filled the ventricle, stroke volume over end diastolic volume. And it is important to remember that ejection fraction can be measured in uh, reflectively in the systemic arteries for the left heart. It can be measured directly in the pulmonary artery in the right ventricle for the right heart. And ejection fraction, above everything else, is the gold standard of hemodynamics. So now we look at our clinical correlates of filling and ejection with these beautiful cartoons. So if we're looking to the far left, we understand venous pressure is about blood that moves from veins to atria into the ventricle, generating a pressure column that we can measure that reflects what we believe is occurring in terms of compliance and relationship to volume. The filling of the right ventricle is typically measured as CVP or right atrial pressure, and typically that pressure is around four to eight millimeters of mercury. And the filling column of blood, which then exerts a pressure or generates a pressure, the filling of that left ventricle, we're not measuring it in the LA, we're not measuring it in the pulmonary veins, but we are measuring it in the pulmonary artery. We can measure it by inflating a balloon on the tip of the PA catheter, which then migrates the catheter forward with blood flow and occludes any visualization of pressure from behind, looking forward to the column of blood in the capillary, venule, vein, left atria, left ventricle. Wow, that was a mouthful. The, that is measured as the pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure or as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And in general, those pressures are around 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Then we move to the systolic pressure, which is the ejection into the artery. And remember, we may not be looking directly at ventricular pressure. We are looking at the reflection of ventricular pressure in the arteries. So representing RV ejection, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Reflecting LV ejection, systemic arterial systolic pressure, 80 to 120. And then we have the great capacitance 
and the great capacity to actually evaluate as best as possible the tone of the artery, the vascular response of the artery, known as the arterial diastolic pressure, reflecting the tone of the artery, which is what is generating resistance. So when the arteries constrict, diastolic pressure goes up. When the arteries dilate, diastolic pressure goes down. So it's always important to remind oneself that there's a constant flow of blood. That column of blood is constant and it's pushed forward by systolic ejection. But the diastolic pressure is the constant volume of blood in the arteries and the veins. Arterial diastolic pressure reflects vascular tone. And normal pulmonary vascular tone is 8 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And normal systemic vascular tone, typically 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. When we utilize vasopressors, what we are determined to do is to raise the vascular tone because the diastolic pressure is a major component of mean. And we're concerned about mean because that gives us an idea of the constant pressure gradient of arterial volume. So the right heart has a unique property. It's a conduit. It's a volume pump. It's not a work pump. It's not a workaholic. It's a conduit of blood flow through the lungs, ultimately filling the left ventricle. The right heart fills with deoxygenated blood from the central veins, maintaining a very effective pressure gradient, which is typically low, and that prevents congestion of tissues or organs. The right ventricle, once filled, will now start to, uh, to contract and will eject blood through the pulmonary vault, delivering that blood flow towards the alveolar capillary interface in order to promote an uptake of oxygen and a removal of CO2. And the pulmonary vault is quite beautiful. It's unique, very low resistance, really short arteries and arterioles, mostly capillaries. And so this is a low resistance chamber, and that's why the right ventricle doesn't have to work so hard, because in normal physiologic state, this is a low resistance chamber. And filling with volume and ejecting volume is about the contractility. The ventricle contracts to move the filling volume against the pulmonary resistance. And this is how we maintain adequate blood flow and optimize lung gas exchange. Now, the left heart does something quite similar but with different blood content and at a different workload. So the left heart is actually a mobilizer because it's a worker. It's a mobilizer of blood flow through the system. The left heart fills with oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins. And in, in order to have optimization, that means your left ventricle should be compliant so that you can maintain a low pulmonary venous pressure and prevent congestion of the lungs. The left heart ejects blood via its very significant work, ejects blood into the systemic fault, which is a very high resistance fault, much longer arteries, and a lot more arteriolar surface. The capillary surface offers little resistance, but in the systemic arterial bed, you have high resistance with a much greater arteriolar surface. The left ventricle does that by contracting to move the filling volume preload against the systemic resistance afterload. And the goal of the left heart is to mobilize blood flow to adequately promote tissue gas exchange. So that brings us to our three major factors which affect stroke volume. And just as a reminder, stroke volume times heart rate is cardiac output, but the greatest of these is stroke volume. And so we're going to focus on stroke volume and those three components. And for this chapter, we're talking about the volume and the compliant or resistant chamber. That gives us a pressure that we measure. And again, I want to reiterate again, pressure is not volume. Preload pressure is a reflection of the volume and the compliance of the chamber being filled. That compliance, which stretches your ventricle, so that it can then recoil. Volume and the chamber compliance are the reflections that we look at when we talk about preload pressures. So 
When we compare the right heart and the left heart, and you can see this here in this beautiful, simple cartoon, that the right ventricular muscle mass is much less than the left ventricular muscle mass. Just by rights, that means the right ventricle will be more stretchable. It's much more compliant, and the left ventricle tends to be a little less compliant. It's not quite as stretchable, and there's a lot more muscle. So as we consider that, we say in a normal physiologic state, when we give volume to a normal physiologic right heart through the central veins, when we give that volume, what we expect to see is very little change in the right ventricular preload or filling pressures. That would be your right atrial pressure or your CVP. So really important to appreciate in the normal physiologic state you have a great right ventricle i could give you a liter of volume perhaps two liters of volume with very little increase in your filling pressure because in the normal state your right ventricle can be distended and stretched easily unlike the left ventricle the left ventricle tends to be less compliant so when in a normal physiologic state when we give volume that actually achieves what our goal is, which is ultimately the filling of the left ventricle, we may see the left ventricular filling pressures respond a little more aggressively to the administration of volume. That left ventricle is less compliant by rights, and so when we give volume, the PAD, the PAOP, or the LAP, all of which are preload measures, filling measures, may go up when we give volume because by rights, the left ventricle is less distendable. So these are the components that we think about when we're evaluating our patients. So I hope I've made it very, very clear that preload pressure, CVP for the right heart, wedge pressure or PAD for the left heart, are about the stretch of the myocardium when filled with volume. If the myocardium is stretchable, the pressure will be lower. If the myocardium is not stretchable, the pressure will be higher. And filling the ventricle depends on a lot of things. The position of, of the patient, are they sitting upright? Are they laying down? Are their legs up in the air? That body position changes the volume load to the ventricle. The patient's total blood volume, and remember that volume exists in the veins and volume exists in the arteries, and we add them all together. That's our total blood volume. Also, valvular integrity, the separation of the atria to the ventricle or the ventricle to the artery. Valvular integrity, are the valves stenotic, are they regurgitant, will affect the volume load of the ventricle and therefore the preload pressure. The work the ventricle has to do if it's ejecting against a stenotic valve or ejecting double filling because the valve regurgitated will also be reflected in the preload pressure. But two really important concepts for us that I am wishing for us to really focus on here is the effect of heart rate on the preload pressure and the effect of mechanical ventilation on the preload pressure. When the heart rate goes up, the ventricle is less compliant because it has less time for diastole and that component of the cardiac cycle is reduced as the heart rate goes up. So as the heart rate goes up and filling time is reduced, the ventricle is less compliant and preload pressure goes up. And mechanical ventilation, which no matter where you are, unless you're using an iron lung, mechanical ventilation is generated with positive pressure. So even if you are on BiPAP or spontaneous breathing with the ventilator with pressure support, you are inducing pressure during inspiration. With mechanical ventilation, the positive pressure during the inspiratory time will be reflected in the state of the myocardium. As pressure in the thoracic cage goes up, you have intermittent compression of the ventricles. And so they now are less compliant and the preload pressures go up. Pumping action of the skeletal muscle, which is what helps us to uh, mobilize blood volume back to the heart, that's required for you to mobilize blood from your distal extremities back into the heart. And then the state of the venous tone, and the venous tone is typically subject to any increase or decrease in sympathetic stimulation or any increase or decrease in parasympathetic stimulation. So just remember, by rights, 
The way of the artery will also be the way of, uh, of the veins. So if I'm dilating your artery, your veins will also dilate. Or if I'm dilating your veins, your arteries will also dilate. If I'm constricting your arteries, your veins will also constrict. So, to remind ourselves, and I love this visual because it gives us such a beautiful idea about the venous gradient and how blood flows from a primary area passively by higher pressure in the primary area to lower pressure in the receptacle area. So when you're looking at the left-hand side of this visual, you can see that there's a significant surface area of the pulmonary capillaries. That's all designed for gas exchange. So every alveoli is massively covered by capillaries. And those capillaries are generating a pressure. Small vessels, a little bit higher pressure, that overcomes the pressure of the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein overcomes the pressure of the left atria. And the left atria overcomes the pressure, the resistance pressure, of the left ventricle. As we look at the visual on the right side of this slide, we see the systemic capillaries, which don't have as much surface area per cell, but a lot more surface area overall because every cell has a surface area. And that pressure from the systemic capillaries must overcome the pressure of the systemic veins, which must overcome the pressure in the right atria, which must overcome the resistance of the right ventricle. You see how that works? Higher to lower. So you can, you can see that if I have a, a tricuspid stenosis, meaning the valve between the right atria and right ventricle, that valve is stenotic, the pressure in the right atria goes up. That means your central venous and systemic venous pressure must go up, and your systemic capillary pressure must go up. And when those pressures start to go up in those capillaries, you start to extravasate fluid into the extravascular compartment. That's why when patients have tricuspid stenosis, they have distended neck veins, they have bilateral edema, and they gain weight very easily because more volume can't be moved well through a stenotic valve. Now, correlate this also to our pulmonary capillaries and our cellular capillaries, reminding ourselves that those capillaries have to generate a pressure that can overcome venous resistance, overcome the RA or LA resistance, which then ultimately overcomes the RV or the LV. And you can appreciate when you look at this visual that a change on one side will ultimately be reflected on the other. So if I have left ventricular failure in a backwards direction, that will affect the right heart. If I have right ventricular failure in a backwards direction, that will reflect on the left heart. And the same will be true for forward. If I have right ventricular forward failure, it will ultimately be reflected in the left heart. If I have left ventricular forward failure, it will ultimately be reflected in the right heart. So the idea that we should conceptually apply in our thought process at the bedside is that preload pressure, CVP for the right heart, PAOP or PAD for the left heart, is affected by two components, volume, and the change in compliance. Now, we want to make that really simple. When we come to the bedside and we say, our patient has a poor stroke volume, so I'm going to give more volume, I'm going to increase that patient's preload pressure by giving volume, and that preload pressure should actually ultimately result in an increased stroke volume. If I decrease your filling volume, that should decrease your preload pressure, and that will cause a decrease in your stroke volume. Well, unfortunately, nothing is that simple because we're talking about two separated systems that share a wall, a sac, and circulations. And when I look at increasing the filling volume to one ventricle, that would be the right ventricle because I only give volume into the veins. I'm not giving volume into the pulmonary arteries. So I'm giving volume into the veins. And that volume is going to increase the volume load of the right ventricle. I have two simple thoughts when I'm doing this at the bedside. My right ventricle can accept it, 
and my right ventricle can eject it. Now we always think about the left ventricle and the right ventricle is the Cinderella stepchild. But it is important to recognize that what CVP indicates to us is volume over change in compliance. So when we give volume, our expectation is the right ventricle should be able to accept it. But if CVP pressure goes up and stroke volume does not, your ventricle was relatively non-compliant and did not accept graciously the volume that you administered. That's the beauty of ventricular compliance. That's the factor that we want to consider. So now we look at compliance as change in volume over change in pressure, and we look to the right side of the graph at this ventricular function curve. On the horizontal is the end diastolic volume, and on the vertical is your pressure, ventricular and diastolic pressure. So you can see on the right curve with a compliant heart, we can add a lot of volume before pressure starts to go up. But on the left curve, which is the less compliant heart, we look at small bits of volume give us a very significant increase in pressure. Wow, this is explosive because it correlates to the perspective that CVP or wedge pressure or PA diastolic pressure are not simple because we have to think about compliance. So if we have a normal compliant ventricle, it's easy to fill. Large increases in volume generate small increases in pressure. That would be to the right curve that says more compliant. The less compliant ventricle is much harder to fill and small increases in volume give us a large increase in pressure because that volume is not mobilized into the ventricle, but it's static in the venous column. That's the less compliant ventricle, the left curve on this diagram. When we look at CVP, PAOP, PAD, we should always be considering the role of compliance change in relationship to the volume that's been administered. So vitally important for us to remind ourselves that we look at venous return and volume loading measured as pressure for the ventricular filling. That's what we call the preload pressure. So number one, volume load. When I give the right heart volume, if that right heart is compliant, CVP will not go up significantly. Pulmonary venous pressures or reflected pulmonary venous pressures, PAD, pulmonary capillary wedge, actually reflecting the left heart volume load, the pressures will not go up significantly if the ventricles are compliant. So volume load and ventricular compliance are reflected by those pressure measurements in the ventricles which are being filled. Factor number two, and it's the big one. This is the big one. Factor number two, ventricular compliance changes affect the elasticity of the ventricle and therefore the pressure. With a non-compliant ventricle, small amounts of volume equal large increases in pressure. So I want to say it as simply as possible. In the non-compliant ventricle, pressure goes up, but the volume into the ventricle goes down, and you have more stas stasis of volume in the veno vault. So now let's carry this forward to what it is we measure at the bedside. So here we're talking about venous pressures, number three. And when we look at venous pressures, reminding ourselves we're looking at systemic venous return to the right heart and pulmonary venous return to the left heart. And venous pressure is actually not pulsatile. It's just flow of blood to the atria, ultimately to the ventricle. So venous pressure actually reflects the chamber it sees most accurately, which is the atria. And you will see as you look at the venous pressure waveform, these small changes in the pressure, not pulsatile, but changes that represent changes of the pressure of the atria. The atria contracts, that's A wave. The valve between atria and ventricle closes, that's the C wave. And the valve between the atria and the ventricle bulges as the ventricle contracts. That valve bulges upwards. 
So I have a pressure change because the atria contracted. I have a pressure change because the valve closed and made the chamber smaller. And I have a pressure change because the valve bulged up into the atria when the ventricle was contracting, and that made the atrial chamber smaller. But none of those changes should be large. They should all be small changes, A wave, C wave, and V wave. And that reflects in our venous pressure, which is primarily a measure of our pressure gradient except in an abnormal system. More on that later. So, now let's apply that to the right heart. And what I would love for you to remember is that central venous pressure is a reflection of the right heart, but it may not accurately reflect what's occurring on the left side of the heart. The CVP reflects right atrial and right ventricular filling pressures the volume and compliance status, and abnormalities of CVP, high or low, abnormalities are always viewed in conjunction with the idea of what's occurring in the pulmonary vault, what's occurring in the right-sided circulation. Is there a tricuspid valve deficit? Is there a pulmonic valve deficit? Do you have pulmonary hypertension? Do you have a pulmonary embolism? Or are you receiving positive pressure ventilation? So. Those abnormalities have to be investigated. So we begin talking about a low central venous pressure, typically less than four, and by the way, could be less than zero. If that CVP is low, our initial response is that we believe the patient is hypovolemic. And indeed, that frequently is true. As long as you're leveled and zeroed, that frequently is true. Now, hypovolemia is going to be treated by, of course, administration of volume. But what I want to be able to evaluate at the bedside is if I give you volume into your central veins, does that volume end up in the systemic arteries? So I look at the relationship of CVP to stroke volume. If CVP is high, typically greater than 12, but with positive pressure ventilation greater than 15, if CVP is high, it may imply right ventricular dysfunction. And that may be the primary cause. Maybe your patient had RV infarct, infraposterior infarct. They have a pulmonary embolism. They have chronic pulmonary hypertension or acute pulmonary hypertension, tricuspid valve dysfunction, pulmonic valve dysfunction, or just straight forward volume overload. In any case, when CVP is high, that is indicating a failure of filling of the right ventricle. And as we fail to fill the right ventricle, you will see secondary effects on the left ventricle. All right, so now let's apply this understanding of our preload pressure measurement in reflection of right ventricular filling. If the right ventricle fills well, the pressure column moves easily into the right ventricle and then out into the pulmonary artery. But when the right ventricle has a failure, it's stiffer, it's non-compliant, it's hyperdynamic, what we're going to see is the RV pressure goes up, so that makes it harder to fill. The RA pressure will go up, and we will ultimately see that in the CVP. CVP indirectly reflects the pressure required to fill the right ventricle. And remind yourself always that the right ventricle should be very stretchable, very compliant. It doesn't have to work so hard, except in critical illness states when all bets are off and normal physiology has flown out the window. So CVP is an indirect reflection of the pressure column filling the right ventricle. And that same strategy is going to be applied to the left heart. The pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure, known to you generally as wedge, is assuming that static column of blood from the ventricle, the visualization of the static column of blood from ventricle to the distal tip of the catheter. And that catheter uh, is allowing us to evaluate the pressure generated in relationship to the volume in the column. So, Backward reflection from LVP to LAP to PAOP to PAD. So if I am monitoring a pulmonary arterial pressure, I'm going to make the assumption that PAD reflects left heart filling. 
That wedge pressure reflects left heart filling. That LA pressure reflects left heart filling because I'm not going to look at LV pressure in the critical care unit. Might do it in the cath lab, but not in the ICU. And we always want to consider that the filling pressure should be correlated to the LV stroke volume. So if the LV filling pressure is low, that typically will imply hypovolemia, especially if the stroke volume is low. If the filling pressure is high, that implies that you have left ventricular dysfunction. But what you must actually evaluate is if filling pressure is high, your expectation, if the left ventricle is dysfunctional, is that stroke volume will be low. So we can see there's a big difference. One is about volume and one is about function. Very important in terms of how we evaluate our patients. So now we're going to talk more significantly and visually about measuring pulmonary artery diastolic and pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure, also known as wedge. So if you look to the dynamic visual on the right-hand side, you will see this yellow thin thread. Everyone calls it the Swan-Gans catheter. It's actually a right heart catheter. It's a pulmonary artery catheter, and that catheter resides constantly in the pulmonary artery. But when you inflate the balloon at the tip of the pulmonary arterial catheter, the catheter moves forward into an occlusion position. Now what that means is it occludes all visualization of the pressure before the catheter tip, and it also occludes all blood flow before the catheter tip. That tip of the catheter is now looking forward into the pulmonary venous circulation, which then fills the left atria and ultimately fills the left ventricle. And remember, when you inflate the balloon, this is the only time in the human body that you will ever transition one catheter between arterial pressure and venous pressure. The balloon inflation is always intermittent. It's never sustained because, of course, it's occluding blood flow as well as pressure visualization. So this is the way we can measure PAD and PAOP only with a pulmonary arterial catheter, and this is, again, the only catheter through the simple inflation of a balloon transitions between the measurement of arterial pressure and the measurement of venous pressure. So PAD and occlusion pressure, known to you as wedge, is reflecting the left atria, and the left atria ultimately reflects LV filling. It's indirect. It's not the best measure. It is an indirect measure that tells us about volume and compliance changes. And remember, volume is going to affect the measure of left ventricular and diastolic pressure. The tension or compliance of the left ventricle is going to affect the measurement of diastolic and wedge pressure. Valve function, mitral or aortic, will affect it. Heart rate will affect it. But the pulmonary venous tone and the intrathoracic pressures will affect PAD and wedge, but are not necessarily reflections of the left ventricle which requires us to apply a very strong view when we are measuring PAD and PAOP. When we see changes, are they left heart changes or are they thoracic pressure or pulmonary vascular tonal changes? So now let's put that into a cartoon form that helps us to appreciate that the venous pressure might be eight, the right atrial pressure is six, the RV pressure is zero. So blood flows down that pressure gradient and it's in the best interest of your patient to have an RV and diastolic pressure that is low so it, the RV doesn't resist filling. When the RV begins its contraction, all valves will close and ultimately, if you're in a healthy valve state, the pulmonic valve will open and the RV will eject up into the pulmonary artery. Now, why I want you to appreciate that 
is because the RV has to generate enough pressure to overcome the resistance in the pulmonary artery, and the resistance in the pulmonary artery has to overcome the resistance in the pulmonary capillaries, and the pulmonary capillaries have to overcome the resistance in the pulmonary veins, and the pulmonary veins have to overcome the resistance of the left atria, and the left atria has to overcome the resistance of the left ventricle. So you can see why this is so important, because the only way your blood flows is down a pressure gradient. You can have an active gradient, which is ejection, and you can have a passive gradient, which is filling. And our focus is on optimizing filling in order to optimize ejection. So I want those ventricles to be as compliant as possible. And part of the way I can control that is my method of ventilation and by assuring that I answer the call of a rapid heart rate. Those are two things I can really affect. Positive pressure breathing methodologies and the heart rate answering the call. So again, reminding ourselves of the ultimate issue, which is if RV compliance is lost, or if I have RV pressure that is elevated, then the systemic venous pressure increases, and the fluid stasis in the vein increases, and the fluid in the capillary increases, and now I have a hydrostatic gradient that pushes fluid from the capillaries into the interstitium, and now you see it as systemic edema. With the pulmonary veins, which load the left atria and loads the left ventricle, if LV compliance decreases or LV pressure increases, then the pulmonary venous pressure by rights has to increase. And as the pulmonary venous pressure increases, the pulmonary capillary pressure increases. And we have a fluid shift, hydrostatic, that pushes fluid into the pulmonary interstitium. And now we have the result of pulmonary edema. So now let's bring that all together as we think about the beautiful and remarkable method of evaluation, the Frank Starling Curve. What Frank and Starling discovered, what they studied, and what they gave us was the understanding that in a healthy heart, the greater the stretch of the myocardial tissue, horizontal axis, the better the recoil, vertical axis. That normal compliance and the stretching of the length tension relationship of the ventricle is to put volume into the ventricle, preload and stretch those fibers in order to improve the increased tension of the muscle, which is a better recoil. So in other words, volume in, horizontal, should affect volume out, vertical. So another way to think about this and to look at it is to appreciate that if I increase your CVP, I should see an increase an LV stroke volume. CVP on the horizontal, stroke volume on the vertical. Frequently, we have great discussions during live lectures with individuals saying, we don't ever use CVP. But CVP is not to be thrown out with the bathwater, just like the PA catheter is not to be thrown out with the bathwater. CVP utilized in a frank starling relationship gives incredible value to evaluating whether or not a patient has responded to volume, whether or not a patient has responded to inotrope, whether or not vasopressors have affected that Frank Starling curve. So to apply this even more succinctly, let's look at the next visual. The law of Frank Starling, and in the words of Barbara, Volume in should be reflected in volume out. Length tension stretch should result in an improved stroke volume. But that requires that you have a ventricle that A, can accept the volume, and B, can eject the volume. And to remember that a normal right ventricle is volume dependent. 
And if I give you volume into your central vein or your peripheral vein, it loads the right ventricle. And can the right ventricle eject it? Volume in should affect volume out. Now, the only volume I'm talking about out here is in the systemic arteries. So I'm going to measure that stroke volume in the systemic arterial bed. I want to remind you that the left ventricle is work dependent. I'm going to give volume into your veins. It's going to reach the right side of the heart, eject through the pulmonary vault, and fill the left ventricle and should be ejected out as stroke volume. And when we are at the bedside and we're giving volume and CVP is going up and stroke volume is staying constant or starts to go down, that may be the time to consider an inotrope because you may need more ventricular power. Of course, the problem with an inotrope is it may increase the heart rate, which then decreases the compliance, which then causes more venous retention of volume. These are very particular methods of understanding and require all of us together to work to have a complex thought about our platform of intervention. So to summarize in just a few simple words, the right and left ventricles are filled during diastole. The role of the veins and atria is to fill the ventricle. The column of pressure generated as ventricles fill with volume is known as the preload or filling pressure, not volume, pressure. Preload pressure is greatly affected by a change in compliance, and it's somewhat affected by changes in volume. But when compliance is decreased, filling pressure goes up, and filling volume may go down, which then leads to a reduction in your stroke volume, which again is what we're really about, how we deliver blood for gas exchange. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be able to share hemodynamics with you today.